Hi, everybody. It's Cheryl. I'm here for um, finally for our Facebook Live, and I'm I should look a little different um, because I'm using the uh, using the laptop instead of the phone. I'm giving this a try. From what I understand, Facebook has worked out a lot of the bugs, so I'm hoping that this works. Um, yes, I see one thumbs up, so I know um, I know that I know that there's some people here and. Uh, yeah, just give me a comment as well, because I want to make sure that the comments are working properly here. Yeah, there we go. Hey, Gail, thank you so much. Hi. Um, oh, good. It looks good, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I was hoping, and can you all hear me okay? Um, yeah, good. Hi. Hi, Kathy and Tess and Diane. Hi, Catherine. Um, hi, Kathleen and Dawn. Welcome. I know I'm sort of looking over at the comments now instead of looking down at my phone, um, but I'm going to try to look up at you most of the time. I have to get used to the new camera now. So um, great. So you can hear me just fine. Awesome. I'm so glad. I'm glad to be here with you. I feel like it's been a while since I've been here. I know the last Facebook Live I did was at the Center for Wildlife in Cape Nettick, Maine, when I was there talking about, you know, how to just be prepared with your be prepared in your car for uh, if you were to find an injured animal or bird. And so if you didn't, if you didn't, if you happen, if you missed that particular Facebook live, it's really worth watching. Uh, I was interviewing Kristen Lamb, who's the director of the Center for Wildlife. And we talked about what to have in your car in order to take care of animals that you might find on the road or anywhere outside in nature. And I just love that place. And I'm, really uh, doing whatever I can to support them because they're educating people about the environment and animals and taking care of these sweet beings that we share our lives with. So anyway, I'm um, bear with me one second while I, there we go. Okay. Cheryl, I'm Oops. here for um, <laughs> I'm, finally I'm, that we let share me, um, our lives with. So let me mute my phone. Anyway, I'm, I can't um, do that. Bear with okay. me one second while I, there we, there we go. go. Okay. Okay, that's not going to work. All right. Thank you. I'm just getting used to using it this way, which is terrific. I think it's going to be okay. All right. So anyways, I had done that Facebook Live, and uh, then I think I took a week off for the holiday. So I'm here. I'm back. It's a beautiful summer's day. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's like 75 degrees and sunny. The sun's starting to set. And um, yeah, you can hear the chirping birds. I know, if this whole laptop thing works, what's great about it is I'll actually be able to take it around and show you some things. I'd love to be able to show you, well, I was going to say I'd like to show you my deck garden, but it sucks this year. Oh my God, it's been so hot, and my deck garden gets sun all day long, and I'm just learning there are some flowers that just don't like it. And um, so, you know, I usually have these beautiful pots with all these, all these, um, flowers spilling over and not so much this year people oh so sad but i but i'll show you i'll show you some stuff at some point once i know that this is sturdy and working so yesterday afternoon i was sitting out in the back deck probably around six o'clock a couple of hours two and a half hours before the sun normally goes down and um, I was sitting there by myself quietly, just taking in the nature, watching the birds at the feeder, listening to the wind blowing in the trees. And, um, and I looked down, and there was a fox standing in the backyard on the edge of the field, as they're often found, just staring at me, like right at me, eye to eye. And I had my camera with me, thank God. And I like reached over for my, ca my camera very slowly and picked it up and turned it on and put the zoom out and then got up very slowly thinking, oh, please don't leave. Please stay here. And I walked right up and he stood right there staring at me. And I took, took a picture. You can see it on my Instagram account. If you follow me, you probably already saw it. But if you go to Instagram and look for username Coach on Call, that's me. I posted a picture of it last night. It's unbelievable. This, the beauty of this animal uh, was just stunning. Um, and I wish I, had, I wish I had a picture. I wonder if I can show you a picture. Let's see if I can do this on my phone. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Yeah, let's see if this will work. If 
if I can blow it up and then show it to you. Look at that. Let me see. I'm going to try and get it out of the glare. No. Oh, there we go. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There we go. Look at that. Can you see that fox? Look at him or her. Gorgeous, right? Look at those ears and that tail. Um, there it is. Come on. Come back. Come back. I mean, it was just stunning. I mean, just see? Just stunning, isn't it? Oh, my goodness gracious. I just, um, I just loved it. So he just stood there looking at me. And you know, I don't know about you, but I have learned that nature is communicating with us all the time. The birds, the animals, the trees, you know, we know that everything is alive, everything holds energy, including rocks. And um, whenever I come across an animal or uh, a bird, something that engages with me in some way, one of the first things I do is I go to, I have a few different decks, um, decks of cards. Hold on. Oh, let me pull these over for you. I have the Druid Animal Oracle. Look at that. I think you can see it straight because I'm on my laptop. How awesome is this? I'm loving this, people. Okay, so the Druid, Druid Animal Oracle is one deck that I have. It was given to me by my friend Jacqueline because we both have Irish roots. And then the Animal Speak um, pocket guide. I'm trying to keep it out of the light here. Animal spirit guidebook. I have that deck as well. And then I have this very cool little deck. Um, it's called animal spirits. Let's see if you can see that. Yeah. Animal spirits. God, I'm trying to keep it out of the light. Animal spirits. And, um, so one of the things I do when I see an animal like that, when I'm visited, I like to go to the card deck and just read what it says about um, the different animals that show up. And I'm trying to find, <laughs> I just had the card in my hands. Oh, there it is. So I go to the decks and I pick out, I pick out the card, I look for the animal and I just see whether or not um, there's any kind of resonance with the message that I get. And so I'm gonna read you Fox and, um, you know, it, it, it definitely spoke to me for sure. So fox, um, symbology is cunning, sexuality, creativity. Like the coyote, the fox is strongly associated with magic, supernatural power, and cunning. In the wild, it exists at the edges of field and forest, and in the mythical realm is a principal mediator between the human and spirit worlds. In Chinese folklore, the fox may assume a human shape at the age of 50, and at its hundredth, hundredth birthday, it becomes either a wizard or a lovely maiden. Red foxes, such as the one depicted in this painting, this is the painting of the fox. Ooh, there we go. Yep, can you see that? Kind of. Um, red foxes, such as the one depicted in this painting, are associated with sexual energy and the creative life force. Some Native American legends speak of a hunter discovering his wife to have a secret fox identity. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, I believe that um, the animals that visit us, the birds that visit us, do so intentionally. I mean, that there is a connection between us. Now, some people might say I'm crazy. That's okay. I don't mind. That's the beauty of getting older. You don't really care when people think you're crazy. Um, but I know that they show up. I mean, how many of you have seen a red cardinal when you're missing someone you love? I remember one morning I went out to feed the birds and I was just missing my little cat Poupon so much. And I stood at the feeder, I filled it up, and then I just started to have a good cry, which, you know, is a good thing to do when you're grieving. And all of a sudden I heard the chirping of a red cardinal and boom, there he was right in the tree across from me. <laughs> Did you hear that? That was a yellow finch. Um, Red Cardinal just right in the tree across from me. And I knew I felt in, in sync with, um, with the animal. Here's another great example. A couple of weeks ago, I had a dream. And in the dream was a giant snake. And the snake came between me and some people that I was traveling with. And it kept pushing me away from these people into sort of like the next stage, the next 
sort of a future spot in the dream. That's what it was, it was this giant gray snake. Um, and it was part of, you know, a, a longer, more epic dream. But I remember thinking, so I remember waking up and I, I write down my dreams and I, I work with a, a wonderful, wonderful dream analyst. And I've learned a lot about myself based on the dreams that I have. So I have this dream about a snake that is sort of making it clear that I am to leave one, one set of people behind and head in a different direction. The next day, I'm at the Center for Wildlife Visiting. And I walk to my car to get something. And when I'm walking back, I meet Kristen, the executive director. And she said, and, and let me back up and just say, I had written down the dream. I had worked through the dream. I thought it was, you know, I really sort of cult, culled the messages of the dream. So I'm walking back from my car and uh, Kristen comes out to meet me. And we're standing in the, the driveway talking. And she says to me, oh, look, look at the snake. And out of the woods comes this snake right in front of us. Now I love snakes. I know I'm kind of unusual. I love them. I used to catch them when I was a young girl and put them in a jar with holes just to look at them. And then I would let them go. Um, so the snake comes right up and I was standing there. I had boots on because we were in the woods. I had boots on the snake came right toward me and he came up and he circled around one foot and then he circled around the other foot and then he left. And I remember Kristen said to me, oh, you just got hugged by a snake. And I thought, yes. But I knew she didn't know about my dream, of course. I knew when that, when that snake came, like, first of all, he, the snakes are generally, you know, they go off on their own. They don't come near people, but he came right to us. And then for him to actually rub around each of my feet before he went back into the woods, I knew that there was a connection between the dream, that this was a visitation, that the snake came to visit, and I felt it, you know, and that's sometimes what we feel. We feel it in our bodies that um, uh, we just know when, we, when we've had a holy moment with an animal. And sometimes those holy moments are with our pets, right? Cats, dogs, guinea pigs, chickens, where you just have some kind of a connection and you feel it and you know that it is a beyond this lifetime, beyond this sort of physical reality connection. And... Um, anyway, one, so one of my favorite things to do is to just sit in the backyard and wait to see who comes to visit. And certainly I've had deer. You all have seen pictures of deer. Um, one time I had a white koi wolf. So it's a cross between a coyote and a wolf, an albino koi wolf come out of the field and stand and stare at me. That was like a mind blowing day. Some of you who used to listen to me on Hay House Radio may remember I was on the radio at the time and I literally had to say to the audience, okay, everybody, hold on. I've got to get a picture of this. You're not going to believe this. And then I posted it the next day. I think it was on Facebook. So um, animals um, have a powerful ability to communicate with us both directly and indirectly in a way that I think really matters. And um, yeah, I just wanted to tell you that today. So I'm here and I'm going to be here for a little bit and I'd love to support you. Oh, Teresa says she loves snakes too. <laughs> I know people kind of think I'm crazy sometimes. You know, truth be told, I know my mom's here. I see you, mom. Hi, mom. Um, mom, I don't even know if you know this, but I used to have a pet snake when I was in my early 20s. <coughs> um, my boyfriend, Gene, and I had a pet boa constrictor. We named him Rasputin Ben Boa, and um, we had him until he got so big he had to go to a zoo. He had to be taken care of. He was, um, I mean, he, he, had to, he needed a bigger home, one that we couldn't provide. But, um, but I do. I love snakes, Teresa. They're really great. Yes, and I've had some amazing visitors. Um, wow, Jennifer says, I've come upon a white horse in the middle of the road in the morning mist. Wow. That's like a mythical experience, a mystical experience for sure. Um, okay. So if you want to see pictures of the animals that I see best to go to Instagram that I always, every night I post gratitude list and I, and throughout the day I post beautiful pictures of beauty. And, um, so again, it's coach on call. You can go over there and follow me. Sometimes I post them here on Facebook, just not as often. Um, but now, oh, Catherine has a pet snake now named Nike. <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
I wonder what kind of snake it is. Anyway, so let's let me um, see if I can offer you some support and coaching. Uh, anything that's on your mind that you'd like some help with, uh, remember, there's the difference between coaching and therapy. Therapy is much more about dealing with the emotional realm, the past, and how it might be influencing the present in terms of um, emotional uh, things that that uh, wounds that need to be healed and um, uh, coaching is really about more future oriented and more action oriented, more st sort of strategic and practical. Um, sometimes it certainly involves the emotions as well, but therapy is really issues like depression and anxiety and um, dealing with people who have mental health disorders, things like that. Sometimes I get questions like that and those are really related to, um, those are related to, those are more therapy oriented questions than coaching questions. So let's keep them to coaching questions if we can. Um, let's see what we have here. Um, Erica says, hi, Cheryl. Thank you for talking about spirit and power animals. I'm working with them through Oracle cards and have had several experiences in the woods with certain animals appearing. This is my question. When doing a course in learning to be a life coach, is it compulsory to learn NLP? I notice pretty much all courses include and teach NLP first. Is it absolutely essential? Well, Erica, I've not seen that, uh, I've not at all seen that every uh, coach training course includes NLP. So for those of you that don't know, NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming, and it's really the study of how the brain, how, what do I want to say? It's how the brain works in relation to how we process information, how we interact with the world, with people in the world. Um, I studied it, Erica, early on because I was fascinated by Richard Bandler's work, um, his, you know, his writings about NLP, although he was a little challenging to read. Tony Robbins did a great job of taking Bandler's work and really synthesizing it and putting it into language that people could understand. And I find it to be incredibly helpful and have found it to be incredibly helpful in my work. So I was excited to learn about it. Um, but the coaching, coach training programs that I was familiar with, uh, and some of them that I'm familiar with now don't require uh, NLP. So I'm not sure what you're looking at, but don't discount it. It could be really cool. I mean, I think it's, I found it personally very helpful and then also very helpful professionally in working with people to this day I use it um, to understand how people communicate and to help people understand how they take in information and process their world and communicate bo both with themselves and others. So. If you go to coachfederation.org, which is uh, the largest independent professional association for coaches, you can find a whole bunch of uh, coach training organizations, some of which do not include NLP. It's not essential by any means. You know, it wasn't a requirement of my training, and I went through a three-year coach training program. So um, check it out. You know, check it out anyway, but also check out some other training programs. Okay, Susan says, insomnia, please help. Oh, Susan, insomnia is tough. Well, no, let me say it this way. Sleep is really important. And uh, I would put it right up there in probably like the top three self-care, uh, ways I practice self-care and ways I, uh, sleep is one of the things I used to always work on with clients, especially as I got older. Uh, one of the first things I'd work on is how much sleep are you getting? Uh, how much unbroken sleep are you getting? Now, the problem with insomnia, Susan, is that uh, the more you can't sleep, the more ang anxious you get about not sleeping, right? I'm sure you've read about it. I'm going to assume everybody talks about um, getting good sleep, and I'll just run through quickly some of the things that are important. Cool room, complete darkness means if you have a clock with an LED light, get rid of it. Keep your electronics out of the bedroom, people. Out of the bedroom if you want to sleep well. I've tested it. makes a huge difference. Uh, sometimes I know for me, if I read when I go to bed, it makes me very sleepy, and I fall asleep within 15 or 20 minutes, sometimes right away. So is there something you can do? Maybe listen to a guided meditation tape. Learn some breathing techniques. Um, now, it also depends, I've found, you know, where are you at in your life? What's going on in your life? What are you worrying about? How busy are you? 
what's going on with your body? Is your adrenal system overtaxed? This is true for a lot of people, particularly in their late 40s, 50s, who've been energizer bunnies most of their life. Susan, I don't know if you've been. Uh, but the adrenal system gets so overworked that the body itself can't calm down in the way that it needs to in order to be able to sleep well. So that means you're probably going to want to get some support in order to be able to uh, calm the body down. Because it's very important to remember, you know, we talk about mind-body health and we say, well, you know, get your, get your mind, you know, if you put good stuff in your head and if you calm your mind and the body will follow. But it also goes the other way. If the body is over animated, if it's overexcited, if it's suffering from adrenal fatigue and you're running on cortisol all the time, then it's going to be very hard to quiet a worrying, busy mind. So what I would recommend, Susan, assuming you've tried some of the things I mentioned, I would really encourage you to make an appointment with either a naturopath or a functional medicine doc. These are both medical professionals who treat the whole body and it's all of its systems, not just one part. I don't believe in that kind of medicine anymore at all, except when you need it. So um, I would see a naturopath or a functional medicine doc so that they can really do an evaluation and check your cortisol levels, you know, check out your adrenal systems, check your hormones even, depending on how old you are, that could be playing a part in it a part in it as well. I want you to know there are some really wonderful non-habit forming supplements that can make a huge difference in the quality and quantity of your sleep, but they should be uh, recommended by a naturopath or a functional medicine doc who's done an evaluation and knows what's right for you. I wouldn't just walk into a store and buy any kind of sleep aid. Um, I'd, want to, I'd want the right one for me. And I've done that before. I've used an amazing supplements to help me get unbroken sleep, particularly as I was entering menopause. And it really worked, Susan. So that's what I would recommend. It would be great self-care for you to uh, see, see a naturopath or a functional medicine doc. Okay. Hey, Brenton. Hi, I'm glad you're here. Uh, let's see. What other questions do we have here, anybody? Um, so Marissa says, I'd like some help with improving my finances. It's hard for me to point out what the problem is. Well, it's hard for me to then support you to give you some coaching, Marissa, if I don't know what the problem is. But I will say this about money, and this is helpful for everybody. When we become a good steward for the money we already have, it's as if we send a message to the universe that we will be capable of handling more. So what does that mean? Um, in my own life, Marissa, when I was struggling as a young woman, when I started my business and I you know, was living alone and really struggled to pay the rent and to buy food and all of that sort of thing, I started to take the, the handling of my finances seriously. And what that meant was I balanced my checkbook every month to the penny. I made sure that I um, created a budget. I don't think I called it a budget because I hate that name, but you know, just a, a financial plan for myself where I knew exactly what my expenses were and I knew what kind of discretionary income I had available to me. I created a debt elimination plan. So I took any of the debt that I had and I put it on a piece of paper with the debt with the highest interest rates on top. And I focused on putting as much money as I could toward those debts and then made the minimum payments on the rest and started to just pay off my debt. And amazing things happened. As a matter of fact, Marissa, if you pick up a copy of Take Time for Your Life, there's a chapter in there called Invest in Your Financial Health. And I tell the story of what happened to me when I started to take good care of my financial health. And all of a sudden, abundance, unexpected forms of abundance started coming into my life. Well, let me say it this way. Unexpected money started coming into my life. And I know it was because I had proven to my higher self that I was a good steward for the money I already had and therefore I could be trusted with more. Now, why is that important? Because our higher self always has our best interest at heart. And if it knows that we're kind of loosey-goosey around money or that we don't have a handle on it or we don't manage it well or we don't take it seriously because it's a very powerful determining factor about our quality of life, then it protects us almost by, um, you know, that plus, of course, our beliefs and um, our early programming, I mean, all of that stuff influences the choices and decisions we make about money. But the higher self, it's almost like 
this higher part of us protects us from getting into trouble by kind of limiting what it allows into our lives. And I know it might sound a little crazy, Marissa, but I've coached literally thousands of people around money issues and have watched unbelievable miracles occur when people start to take full responsibility for their financial health. So you can look at things like, do you balance your checkbook? Do you know how much money you have? Do you know how much money you spend? Like, what are your expenses every month? Do you know what your income is every month? Is your income more than your expenses? Are you using charge cards when you can't afford to use them? Like things like that. There's no judgment. And this isn't about beating yourself up at all. That never works. It's always about loving yourself into a healthier relationship with money. I recommend um, Money Love by Kate Northrup. It's a really good book about money. I like that one a lot. Um, I often recommend uh, Susie Orman's books. All of them about money are also, you know, I've learned a lot from Susie. I know Susie and I owe a lot of the state of my financial health today to her good coaching and her good advice over the years and the books that I've read. So get educated about money as well, about finances. Um, and start to affirm the universe loves me and sends me money every day. Just start to affirm that. I open my arms to receive the full abundance of the universe. Even if you don't believe it, just keep saying it. But here's the thing. It's not enough to, to just affirm abundance. You've got to do something. You have to take some kind of action that really shows the universe and your higher self that you actually are taking it seriously. And then I bet you, Marissa, you're going to see things start to turn around and I'm going to want to hear about it. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Looking at some of your questions here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Coaching people, how can I protect? Okay. I'm just, I'm looking for some of the questions that I think are going to be um, appropriate here. Um, so Stacy says, hi, Stacy. I'm struggling with the loss of my dad. I see a grief therapist and it helps while I'm there. But once I have, uh, but once I leave, I feel the profound loss like it was that day. How do I not feel my dad's loss so deeply and raw? It has been almost two and a half years. Well, Stacy, um, I have a few things to say about that because I'm becoming an expert in grief. <laughs> Having lost my best friend, my cat, and my dad all in like, you know, a two-year period. Um, first of all, there's no time frame on grief. It takes as long as it takes. And it doesn't go away. It's not like we kind of get over the loss and then um, we suddenly feel better and everything's back to normal. When I lost my cat, Poupon, there was a good friend of mine who was a, a, a shaman, really. He said to me, Cheryl, the moment you lose somebody, you are changed. You are no longer the same person. And yet you're living in the same life, dealing with the same people, going to the same job, but you're no longer the person you were before that being, that loved one died. And therefore, everything feels sort of a bit off kilter. You know, you feel like you're walking in a familiar world, but it doesn't feel familiar and things don't feel right. Over time, I think what happens if we allow ourselves to fully feel the grief and to work through it. Well, let me actually, let me back up and say this. The first year my dad, so my dad died in, um, this is 2018. He died in uh, 2016, at the end of 2016. And he died in, in November. Honestly, Stacy, I feel like the first year, in some ways I was just in, um, still in, I don't want to say shock, but I just, I, I, I couldn't fully take it in, what, what it meant, the enormity of that. And so it was sort of like when the second year began, I think also losing my cat, is when I really began to do some deep grieving work. And, um, and over time, what happens is we begin to integrate the loss into our lives in a meaningful way. At least that's what's happening for me. We start to understand um, how how the loss can really shape us in a new and different way. And we start to hold our loved one 
in spirit form in a different way in our lives. And I think it's, it's unique for each person. But I would also, and I would also say this, Stacy. I'd wonder about other losses in your life. I'd wonder about, um, so you say your dad passed two and a half years ago and you feel it still so deeply. I wonder if that loss is combined with other losses. So that's one thing I would think about. And then here's the other thing I'm going to say to you, and this is really important. Jung, Carl Jung, talked about projections. You know, how we project certain things onto people. We project the dark parts of us. So, for example, when you have someone in your, in your life that bugs you or you don't like or they piss you off or you, you just think, you, you, know, you, you know, how they, they behave horribly or whatever, they're often, when we're judging other people, we're often projecting dark parts of us onto them, parts that we can't be with or we're not even conscious of. We do the same thing with our light. You know, when we fall in love with people that we think are fantastic, and I'm not talking romantically, but when we see people and we're just like so enamored by them, they're usually holding a piece of our light. So Stacy, I would invite you to look at what it is that your dad held for you that you haven't reclaimed yet. I know that that's a, um, that's a tricky sort of question, but I really want you to just sit with that. What did your dad hold for you? Um, what qualities of character might he have held for you that you need to reclaim for yourself? And I also think that when a dad dies, there's certain messages we get from dad and certain messages about how to be in the world that we get from mom and dad separately. And I think when dad dies, um, or when, when any parent dies, we now are sort of thrust into forming our own identity and our own rules for how the world works. And that's a, that's a big deal. It's a big deal to lose a parent. It takes time to integrate that experience and to learn all that there is to, to learn about that from that. And so um, I would just wonder, when you feel that deep loss or that longing for father, what is it, you know, make a list of all the things you loved about your dad and then find out, pay attention to whether or not you're expressing those qualities yourself in your own life? What do you need to reclaim from him? And that might be helpful in some way. I don't know. That's, that's really more of an intuitive thought, and I hope that's helpful to you. Um, all right. So I'm trying to be able to see questions here, and I can't see all your questions. I'm sorry. But let's say, um, hi, Cheryl. Uh, Ju Julie says, hi, Cheryl. I feel a constant need. I feel a constant need or desire to start a support group for women over 50. So many things to discuss and help each other. How do I, oh, I just lost it. See, I'm trying to figure out how to see your comments on here. I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna assume you asked me, how do I get started with that? Terry, I'm, I know you're on, and if you know of a way for me to be able to, I can't scroll up to see the comments, I can only scroll down, which is kind of a drag. This is new for me using the laptop. I'll figure it out for the next one. But I imagine you're asking, how, how would I get started? Um, I would start by contacting two or three friends uh, that are over 50. I imagine you have them. Invite them to bring two or three friends, people that you don't know maybe, and uh, just pick a date. Like that's the best thing I can tell you is just pick a date. Hello. Just pick a date. Invite three or four friends, have them invite each, bring even one friend, and just begin. Can you hear my bird? Red-winged blackbird. Just begin the support group that way. And, um, and you could even think of it as a test support group. So don't worry about charging for it at first. Just start by putting a few people in your living room and start having conversations about what it means to be 50 and what your life is like now and what kind of support you need and what kinds of questions you have. And then, excuse me, that the group itself will teach you about your next steps, without a doubt. Um, so really what I'm talking about here is energy. When we want to do something, we, when we take action towards doing that, what we're doing is we're, we're moving energy. And we're moving energy in the right direction. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to move energy in the direction of this dream. Like stop just dreaming it and desiring it and start doing it. 
get out there, make the phone call, pick a date, and just decide if two people show up, if 20 people show up, you're going to have an awesome experience and you're going to learn a lot. And if in fact you want to do it for money, I can't scroll back to find out, but if you want to do it for money, then that will be your test group and that will sort of give you information about what you'll need to do in order to be able to do it professionally. And you'll have a built-in marketing team to support you in finding other members for you as you go along. Okay. I hope that's helpful. Let's see. Um, I'm going to try and grab a question that, um, Oh, maybe it looks like it's going around. Let's see. Um, yeah, so Deb, I just want to say Deb's saying that she found someone to help with bioidentical hormones who is conservative, which I love that you capitalize that because I think that's important and really knows her stuff. You, you found out you were low on progesterone and now you sleep like a baby. There's a great example of what I'm talking about. Thank you, Deb, for saying that. It's really true. Makes a big difference. And um, yeah. Very good. Let's see. Um, yeah, Jennifer, I am open to all of the goodness and abundance in the universe. Great, great um, affirmation. Love that. Um, okay. Deb wants to know, do you have a book that talks about our higher self? Um, Stand Up For Your Life talks about some of that. And The Unmistakable Touch of Grace really is all about our connection to, um, to grace and uh, this divine energy that's available to all of us, regardless of whether you believe it or not. Um, you don't have to work hard to earn it. You don't have to be good enough to deserve it. It is available to all of us. The question is, how awake are you? How uh, present are you to this energy? And, um, and I find that the practice of extreme self-care really ignites that energy. And it's like we begin co-creating with the universe when we take really good care of ourselves. And so um, that book might be helpful as well, The Unmistakable Touch of Grace. It's kind of, I can't say it's my favorite because I love them all. And I really love Waking Up in Winter because it's so different. You know, the, my newest book, um, because it's a journal and it's, it's sort of a bit more artistic and poetic, which is what I wanted. But Grace has a special place in my heart, I'll tell you. It really does. <laughs> okay. Um, Anna says, what do I do about the social pressure to be in a relationship and have kids? Okay, Anna. So my question to you, if you were sitting in front of me, I would say to you, define social pressure. In particular, tell me who in your life might be pressuring you about being in a relationship and having children. I know that sort of generally in the universe, there's this whole idea about you get married, you have kids, you get the white picket fence and all of that. We're kind of moving beyond that automatic expectation, but oftentimes there's somebody in our ear that's kind of putting the pressure on in that way. Or it might even be that, you know, you've got lots of friends that are having children and getting married and you're putting the pressure on yourself by what you see. Um, so, I'd want to know what the social pressure is, and I would invite you to fully own where you are in your life and to let people know that you're celebrating that, so that if anybody's saying to you, oh, when are you going to get married? When are you going to have kids? You can say to them, I love my life, and um, if it's going to happen, it's, it'll happen, and I'll let you know when it does, but in the meantime, I love my life. Now, if that's the case, <clears throat> Because is the social pressure also mirroring pressure you feel internally, sweetheart, to get married and to have a family or to be in a relationship and have a family? I wonder that because you say that you're 37. So um, I also wonder if that might be what's going on. And so if that's the case, if I were 37 and I felt really hungry for a relationship and a family, um, I would probably get my butt into therapy, specifically with somebody who works around rela healthy relationships. And I'd be doing some work around how ready I feel internally to be in a relationship, what it is I'm looking for. And if you, if you look at um, The Unmistakable Touch of Grace, I tell the story of how I met my husband, the process that I used. I met him through a personal ad. This is long before internet dating. Um, but I would do some work around becoming really ready for a relationship and really working with somebody to help identify who is it that you're looking for 
What is it that you really want? And how can you feel more empowered about having that? Um, those are some things that I would recommend without knowing more of the specifics. That's always tricky when I don't have the specifics. Um, yeah, Dawn says, it's been nearly three years since we lost our beloved dog and still mourning. Listen, animals are extraordinary harbingers of unconditional love. They teach us all about love in a way that I don't think any human being can. They're like this, these incredible creatures that come here. You know, when you have that kind of soul connection with an animal, um, it, the pain never leaves. Like I find with Poupon, there, there are more and more days go by where I don't cry. But when I do feel the pain, I feel it as intensely as I did when he died. It doesn't last that long. It comes and it goes. Um, but it feels like intense. When it's here, it feels just as intense. And I welcome it. And I let myself cry. And I see it as honoring him. But I'm at the point where I'm no longer sort of filtering my life experience through grief, through the lens of grief, because, you know, I'd see anything, and, you know, a dead bug, and I'd think, oh, he's dead, just like my cat. <laughs> I'm kind of moving beyond that stage a bit, knock on wood. Um, but it takes a while, and I don't think we ever, I remember, as a matter of fact, um, Dawn, I want to tell you that, so last Thanksgiving, Poupon died on November 14th, the day before my birthday. And um, we were supposed to have this big Thanksgiving dinner at my home. I'll finish with this story. We were supposed to have this big Thanksgiving dinner at my home. And um, I just knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't entertain. I couldn't, I didn't want to cook a meal. We had a friend visiting from London and we all went to the Stage Neck Inn where I hold my retreats, which by the way, remind me to tell you about my retreat because I just finished it. Um, and I went, I called the, the sales manager at the stage neck in and I said to her, I know I'm coming into Thanksgiving last minute, but I'm wondering if by any chance you have a table. And I told her how I had lost my cat and she said, I'll take care of you. They gave us a beautiful table. I remember it was me, Michael, our friend Eileen and John Holland also came with us for Thanksgiving. We were all alone. So we said, let's go to Thanksgiving together. Dawn, when I got to the stage neck and I saw Ruth and I thanked her so much for giving us, you know, getting us a table last minute because they're always booked. We were standing in a corner, I remember, and she said to me, Cheryl, she looked me in the eye and she said, Cheryl, I lost my dog 20 years ago and I still miss him. And her eyes filled up and she started to cry. And she said to me, you know, I know what it's like to lose a beloved animal. It, it, the pain never goes away. And if I can help somebody who's going through that, I want to do that. And I remember thinking, Dawn, when I, I thanked her and hugged her, and when I walked away, I thought, there's such healing in sharing our stories with one another, such healing in sharing the grief that we feel. Then we know we're normal. You know, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with still feeling the pain. I mean, this is what love does. Love causes, you know, causes us to feel the pain of loss as well. And anyway, but it does get better. I know you know that. I do too, and um, yeah. All right, so the retreat. I haven't announced it yet, but I'm about to. And this time, the retreat is, um, I do them twice a year. This time, October 26th through the 28th, I think it is. Um, I'm gonna be posting it probably in the next day or two. Uh, and anybody who's on the wait list, so if you go to CherylRichardson.com and you click on the retreat button, um, put yourself on the wait list. Those are the people that, that will get notified first. And this time I've invited my husband, Michael, to do the retreat with me. He normally does intuitive readings on Saturday night, and people love him, and they always want more, and he's only there for an hour and a half or two hours. He'd be there for like 10 hours if, if I didn't bug him to stop. But um, we're going to do the retreat all about embracing change, you know, embracing the changes, getting unstuck and moving forward with our lives. And Michael is going to do a good part of the weekend with me. We're going to combine his gift for intuition with my coaching, although he's also a really terrific coach. And uh, we're going to work together. It's going to be for men and women. And, um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So we'll be announcing it in the next couple of days. Make sure you're on the wait list if you want to get, um, you know, if you want to hear about it first, because it all, it, they, they usually sell out. So it's good to register early if it's something you want to come to. Okay. So yes, Joe, at some point we will talk about the things that drain us and the importance of dealing with them. And um, uh, yes, thank you, Elena and um, Jennifer and Don. Um, 
thank you everybody. Thank you for being here with me. I'll look forward to talking with you next week. And it looks like this kind of worked, this whole laptop thing, except for not being able to scroll back. Um, uh, I will figure that part out. Even if it means having it on my phone at the same time, I might do that. But in the meantime, thank you for being here with me. I always appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you again. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Lots of love.